incredible. You have to wonder how the president really is able to concentrate on any one thing because there are so many things that require his attention. Although, again, he went on the offensive the last few weeks, and I think it was the right thing for him to do. Uh, I think, you know, 15 months into his presidency, there's a lot of people looking uh, for reasons to call his presidency a failed presidency. And I think there are two pieces, three pieces of this that are key. One is getting something passed. I don't think this health care bill is perfect, and it's very partisan. If it comes across as a landmark legislation that is sweeping, then he's going to get some credit for it one way or the other. Uh, number two, I think he has to find a way to end the war. But fortunately for him, at least on the Iraq front, uh, he's got troops coming home at the end of the year, which will make a big difference to people perceiving the war as coming to an end. And then finally, I think the economy has to pick up. And it's doing it very slowly. But if it does that, I think people will focus away from health care and back to the things in their life that are uh, meaningful and impactful, like you know, getting a paycheck and finding a job. Well, I think Obama and the Democrats have paid a very high price here for health care. And I, I, I think it's going to be a bloodbath in November. You really do. Elections. I, I really do. I, I think there's going to be a tremendous backlash that's going to come back to bite them here. And and all the Republicans who just sat back and said, we're just going to sit back and watch. And I, I, think, uh, I think you're going to be surprised in November to see what happens. Let me ask you, because of your legal background, you know, there's been a lot of talk as well about how this landmark legislation could, in fact, butt the federal rights up against state rights. So what happens as a result of this bill? Are you now somehow creeping into that state authority? Well, 10 states have already jumped in and filed suit to block this legislation, and Virginia being one of them. The ink is barely dry on this bill. But you bring up some interesting points, and it's what's known as the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause is one of Congress's broadest grants of authority to regulate just about anything that affects commerce in the United States. The Commerce Clause was used to actually uh, combat racism in the 60s it, because uh, there were folks that couldn't stay in hotels in the South. Congress stepped in and passed legislation to address that issue. So that just shows you how the Commerce Clause can, can just about touch It gives you some level anything. of imminent domain over any, right. anything, I guess. And, and I've got to believe that, that the federal government is going to trump the states in this battle. The states may be able to slow it down. They may be able to put a monkey wrench in a few things here and there. But I believe at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, the federal government's going to win this battle. I think ultimately it comes down to where you sit. You can either want change if it's perfect change, or you can want change if it's easier to get if it's imperfect. I think what we have now is the latter. We have change. It's probably imperfect, which means that there will be several cycles of improvements to this bill. But ultimately, I guess I'm just happy to watch the legislative flow happen. Uh, most of us, I was fairly engaged in watching my government actually enact this bill. So in that sense, it was exciting. Uh, I will be curious to see what happens in the next several months, though. I think it's going to be a difficult battle. Have you received your census form in the mail yet? If not, be on the lookout because they're arriving in your mailbox this week. And there were a number of articles in the Post this week about what the census and what all this means and how can we digest all of this. And one of the great was, was from the Sunday Post where this woman was actually looking at the census form 30 years ago and how she was trying to fill it out. And she really didn't know what box to pick because, you know, there were just only a few choices back then. And now we have this multitude of choices. And we've gone the other extreme. We've gone to the other extreme. And if you still don't know where you, you fall within the um, race category, you can always check the other box and try to explain it. So uh, what she wondered is what if everybody, just as a joke, put that they were Polynesian? So all of a sudden the U.S. is made up of 50% Polynesians. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you bring up you bring up actually a very important part of the census, you know, because uh, this year what they've done with part of the census is they have increased the number of boxes. So most of us are used to the five or six general categories: are you white, Asian, you know, Latino, and and Asian usually is just one box, and you're either Pacific Islander. I've been Pacific Islander for years. I think you have been too, because we just never had a box that said Indian. Asian Indian. Well, this year you'll find an Asian Indian box there. In fact, you'll find several, um, what I would say, granular classifications within what you might consider a subset or, or regional parts of the world. That said, you can check more than one. And that's a symptom of the fact that many of us are marrying out of our race, out of our um, ethnic pools, 
And consequently, we have children that are a quarter this and a fraction of that. Well, how many boxes do you check off before it becomes meaningless to classify yourself any which way? And then if you have other, that leaves even more possibilities. And so it has a lot of people scratching their heads to say, am I 51% this and 49% that? What should I check? Well, also, your guess is as good as mine. I, last month, I was in Puerto Vallarta, and everyone was talking to me in Spanish. So I, I might, <laughs> I might check the Latino box this year. But um, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are are ang anxious about the census. They have all this anxiety about providing this information to the Census Bureau, and I think that's ridiculous. I mean, you can go put your name in Google and, and search it and see all the information that comes back about you that's out there already. Never mind that your life is splashed across Facebook and Twitter and like half a dozen social media forums. Right. We give our information up all the time. Every time that you swipe your credit card, you give up information. Yeah, and, and I think it's important for everybody to respond to this because if you're like me, I want to know. I, I want to know who makes up America right now. I mean, this is a massive, massive undertaking, and it is very important because it tells us a lot about the demographic makeup of our communities, which is, of course, how you get funding, how you get your uh, local dollars that come in from your local taxes. But, you know, it's, it is creating legitimate fear as well. For two reasons. One, California uh, in the year 2000 was actually one of the first states, the first state actually, where the white population went below 50% for the first time. That was 10 years ago. Uh, back then, we all know that uh, California attracts a lot of uh, immigration. But other states, you're starting to see the same pattern. Now, 10 years later, 2010 survey, there may be many states that come in with the white population for the first time coming under 50%. And what that is doing is it's creating a state of white anxiety. I'm serious, folks. This is an article in Time Magazine about the white anxiety crisis where America, especially white Americans, are feeling the heat. They're feeling like they are now the new minority in their own homeland, which is a significant shift. That's yet another reason why John Boehner wants to appear so tan everywhere. <laughs> he wants to join in with the rest of us.